This is Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast, the only fan podcast to name a canon Star Wars creature and to be endorsed by the writer director of The Last Jedi. Don't get cocky! Ryan Johnson. Uh, on the, what's the new one? What's the new Knives Out movie he's coming out with soon? What is it called again? Don't speak that. Wake Up Dead Man. That one, yeah. And, and that movie Dead too. Man. I'm interested. Anyway, um, on the 4th of July weekend, we started watching MCU movies and couldn't stop. Uh, it was a blast revisiting some of the greatest moments in Marvel movie history. Um, and it's because we were on the Captain America arc. Right. We were doing a Captain right. America thon, but that kind of touches a little bit of everything mm, for those first it pretty much three does. or four phases. Um, so yeah, you know, we got a little bit of taste of everything, but, uh, so this week we're going to each share our favorite MCU film and why we love it so much. This is Tatooine Sons. It's true. It's true. All of it. What is the name of the Porg on the Millennium Falcon? Force is strong in my family. What do you think his name is? <laughs> it's a big moment. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Maybe Turbis? Do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? <laughs> Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream... That Porg's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys record an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was lit. So which is the which MCU movie? So you guys are getting ready to go in September, right? September 6th. To go see... Tell, tell me what this is, Nate. It's Hans Zimmer live. It's his... So why is this such a big deal? Well, it's the first time he's had a U.S. concert in over seven years, I think, so... Hello there. It's been quite a while. And lot. what is it like? I mean, what's like the allure of a Hans Zimmer concert? Is it like a rock show? Than kind a, of, yeah. Like orchestral concert? He just does a compilation of all of his stuff and makes new Has he done an MCU film? No. No, he has not. Okay. So you guys are big movie film score super nerds. Mm -hmm. Like across the board. That's what you guys listen to. Mm -hmm. Exclusively. Like we've even joked about doing a podcast series called The Movie Makes the Music. The Music Makes the Movie. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Which, I'll start with you. I'll start with you, Sam. Which MCU film has the best score? I never ask that question until after I've done it. Mm, This is the right answer. Yeah. I mean, I can only, there's only one that really stands out. And it's um, it's Doctor Strange. Really? Mm-hmm. And then Nathan. That is the right yeah, answer. Yeah, I knew Nathan was going to be no right. that. There's no doubt that is the right answer. It is. It, yeah. it, Did I say it right? I like this guy. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> there's there's really no other MCU score that feels as fleshed out as that one. And and Well, and the, it's the, got the harps accord. It's and the varied. entire movie. Yeah. Yeah, the entire movie gets varied and it follows the arc of of Stephen Strange throughout the entire thing. It goes from more of a piano to the harpsichord as the theme goes on. Mm-hmm. It's it's really good. It's a really great score. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's consistently good across the board. There's right. lots of movies that have great themes, but like the whole score isn't as good exactly. as the Doctor Strange one. Yeah. But um welcome to Tatooine Sons of Pop Culture Podcast. We believe that pop culture is the mythology of this generation. Lots of that in Marvel. Yes! Um, and that there's a story written on our souls and that these myths speak to that story and that's why we're looking back at our favorite Marvel movies and discussing what we love about them. Um, don't forget to subscribe to Stubs... Stubstack? Stubstack. 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 Like sub Stubstack. your toe stack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Substack. Uh, we're doing something a little uh, a little special. We're pushing for... For some subscribers, I'll let Dad um, bring this one in. We have a mission for you. I think the dog's coming yeah, in. Yeah, he's coming to join he's us. He's going to join us. Rex, hey, Rex, our dog, named after Captain Rex. Don't tell Hi, Mom. Buddy. Mom thinks, thinks it's, it's named after Rex from Toy Story. Every word in that sense was wrong. It's, it's not. It's actually named after Captain, Captain, Captain Rex from Star Wars. Captain Rex. Wars. We named The first dog we named a Star Wars character off of. Our second dog we named after a Star Wars character. That's so, true. you know, we had to balance That's it true. out. Anyway. So, uh, we're trying to get to 100. And we 100 need, subscribers we on need your 100. We're on We need your help being 100 one of our hundred subscribers but once we do that we are going to release a substack exclusive special podcast series Mm -hmm. called 
the Christian myth, where we are going to be looking at, you know, we talk about it at the opening of every episode, right? There's a story written on our souls. These myths speak to that story. That is literally ripped out of Ecclesiastes. I think I'm remembering the, the verse number right now. Ecclesiastes 411 that says that eternity or heaven is written on our hearts. And so we're going to walk through the Christian myth. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I say myth, I'm not talking about like myth as in being not true. I'm talking about myth as being the classic right. philosophical idea of a myth that's a massive epic story. Mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis came to faith as a result. He was an atheist that came to faith in Christ and became one of the greatest Christian theologians and apologists of our time as a result of the myth of Christianity and understanding it and talking about and it with J.R.R. Tolkien, Tolkien yeah. as part of the Inklings. So we're going to look at what is the Christian myth, whether or not you believe that that myth is true or not. I think that you're going to find the story, the myth of what the Christian story yeah, is. I mean, even if fascinating when right. you hear it that way. Mm-hmm. The problem with most people's opinion about Christianity is that it is not told mythically. It is told dogmatically. And I think that's why we have so many problems. Explain dogmatically. It's about rules and regulations mm-hmm. and do's and don'ts. As and there are story. things within our faith that are part of that. But the reality is we miss the big wonder of the story when we miss the mythic element of it. And so we, when we get to a hundred subscribers, I will begin releasing a series. I've already been getting, begun planning it. I've already got the first episode scripted. We're going to release a series of episodes exclusively for those of you subscribing on Substack on the Christian myth. And I think that you're going to be, I think you're going to love it. I think you're going to be fascinated about it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, enough talking about what we're going to talk about. Let's talk about what we're talking about. So let's start with uh, with you, Nate. So who talks first? You talk first. I talk first. You know, you kind of teased it a little bit with your favorite score, but um, your favorite movie, MCU, mm-hmm. MCU movie. Excuse me. Is now, what is your favorite movie? It's Inception, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Do you know, like, I think yesterday was the birthday of Inception. Mm-hmm. Really? It was the Inception of Inception. The Inception. Uh, no, because the Inception happened when he thought about it. That's right. True. Which was like, 10 or years did he think came about out. it? Oh, was it somebody? Did they plant the? Ooh, did they plant that crazy. in his yeah. brain? Yeah. I mean, we could. Anyway, your favorite movie is Inception, but your favorite MCO movie is Doctor Strange. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. So, why do you love this film? Something like. Yeah, I know you could probably talk about it for an entire thirty minutes, but boil it down. You know, size it if you could. You know, Twitter it ninety seconds. Yeah, Twitter <laughs> it. Why do you love this film? I, I don't even think I need ninety seconds. Impressive. I think I can firmly say that it has the greatest single movie character arc in the MCU. Most impressive. That's fair. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, he he goes through one of the greatest arcs in an hour and fifty minutes, and it's just seamless it's perfect so you're saying that he doesn't necessarily have the best character arc in the mcu you're just saying that this film has the best character arc contained to no a it's, it's film. hard to compete with loki and and mm. iron man and all that as in character arcs but, but they contained had... in a single film yeah this beats any of them okay so. interesting um Let's go. Let's do a little round table. We always, you know, when we talk about movies and stuff, we like to give our little letterbox rating, which if you're not familiar with what that is, it's an app where you can log the movies you watch and give them a rating. You can see whatever you should follow Sam and Nate on there. I think it's at like Sam, Jesse and Nathan, Jesse, if you want to. Nate, Jesse, I don't remember which one it is. um, So it's just a fun way to, you know, rate what you're what you're watching. Um, And the way the system works is it's five stars you can give them halves and then there's also a like or not like function on it so we kind of have have adopted that system when we talk about movies so what would you rate dr strange on letterboxd um dad i want to i want you to go i'm gonna go first yeah i want you to go first okay i i'm just gonna be transparent i didn't i mean it was it was a fine movie the first time i saw it i didn't really care for it the same way that nathan did um with it i've grown to appreciate it more and more but i haven't watched it very many times (laughs) it's been a long time since you've seen it you know but every time i've watched it i've liked it more so i'll go i'll go four out of five stars and a like i mean that's pretty solid that's pretty for me that's a pretty high rating that's pretty good what about you sam uh i would probably give it 
four as well. I'm kind of, it's been a minute since I've seen it. Um, but I have the, the, the theme in my head now. The theme is great. We talked about it in the um, the show. You know, I feel like I'd have to, I'd have to rate Multiverse of Madness higher. Um, <laughs> I just, I just, I just know he's kidding. Yeah, so I'm doing fine. that to tease Nate because he was very disappointed with Multiverse of Madness. Um, but no, but for real, this film, um, I would give it a four. Um, and a like, and you know, I'm pretty much almost any MCU movie I'll get a like. But uh, it was a, it was a really solid movie. It was fun. You're right. It does have a great character arc for Steven. I love the magic. The visual effects are great. So They're the care. best in the MCU to mm-hmm. this day for sure. Mm-hmm. What would you yeah. give it? It's it's five and a like. Okay. I, I don't think that it can. It doesn't make sense to rank it lower. Uh, it's a great arc and one of the shorter MCU movies as well, which just shows the storytelling capabilities that they've achieved with it. I like the themes. I like mm. the uh, not not like musical themes, but kind of yeah. the the overall themes of the yeah. movie. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, you know. Um the, the you know you you mentioned themes and like one of the major MacGuffins of this film is the, the time stone right mm-hmm. and because of the prominence of that um, Doctor Strange kind of centers on the idea of time and things like that right in that theme um, you know how how does this movie address the concept of time I'll let you go Nate yeah you, this is your this is your jam just a quick you know it, it it approaches time as a very it is a very serious subject and a lot of them are concerned about it but Stephen sees it as more of a in in certain ways something to be appreciated but something that can be molded a tool a tool um with the eye of Agamotto and all that. And, and we see him, you know, use it at the end against Dormammu and, and kind of putting Dormammu in a prison, prison of eternity, uh, until Steven gets what he wants and he leaves earth. So he does see it as a tool, but he also appreciates the power of time. So, mm-hmm. and he doesn't abuse it. No, no, not at all. Which, you know, you mentioned that moment with Dormammu, which is such a creative way for the the hero to defeat the villain. Yep, the it's MCU. not a big CGI no, it's, fight. It, I mean, you have that with you Wilson's kind of had that with Caecilius, yeah. kind of, but it's shorter. It, it, the The battle is really with the mind games of Dormammu, which and it shows. Do we know what happened with Dormammu? Not like yet. Where no. he's, he's at still right? just he'll doing prob- his thing. He'll probably show back up in the third Doctor Strange or something. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. which they may be announcing at San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, I, by Hopefully the time you're listening get, to this, you know, it's this week. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully so. they get a good director back. So, um, but y'all, you, you mentioned uh, themes in Doctor Strange, right? And one of those is reality and perception. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what we what we see isn't always necessarily what is real. Um, I think what you know an interesting moment of all of that is when uh, Doctor Strange first makes it to. The Sanctum Santorum. Comertage. Or Comertage, that's it. And he's like, it's just a, another building. There was nothing special. She's like, starts bringing out acupuncture books and, yeah. and chi and stuff. And he's like, oh, so this is a joke, right? And then there's that moment when he gets like hurled through through time and stuff. <laughs> dimensions. Uh, dimensions and, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, Dad, Nathan kind of had his, his, you know, talked about time and things. But what, what are your thoughts on this whole concept of, um, you know, what you see may not be what what's really there. Yeah. I think it it, it relates kind of to time. Um, when I think about this, when I think about time, I think about, you know, we talked about it even in the uh, previous part of the show, when we were talking about the Christian myth, Mm. the idea is we look at time linear. There's a beginning, there's an end, and then there's everything that happens in between. And as, as what I like about Dr. Strange is, is he's able to see time as something that he, that, can be perceived as being outside of time and looking into time and perception is the same way, right? So you're looking at everything from, from multiple dimensions, multiple angles with it. And I, and I love the idea that time is not just kind of like something that can be moved forward through and moved back through but it can be it changed around i think that that we see that a lot more in some of the current stuff that's happened within post end game mm, timeline um, timelines yeah. and the multiverse and that's why you know i mean as much as multiverse of madness was 
a mess. Uh, as not as uh, uh, satisfying of a film as we had <laughs> hoped it would have been. Yeah. It's not as bad as you. As no, I, I, no. I, but it. The the reality is, you know, we we see that more in that. I I think that that's where where it comes. What you see isn't what you. It's like what we saw last night with the the illusionist at the uh, at the church thing that we <laughs> oh, went yeah. to, that's where what, he was like he was talking about you know time, you know the 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 way we perceive things is 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 different with it anyway. So I know mm-hmm. I'm not making a lot of sense with it, but yeah. Um. Uh, you know, one interesting thing, and, uh, you know, it, up until this point, I didn't notice this sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Co- concept of the character until literally just now, um, is this conflict between science and mysticism, right? And that science and faith or magic don't, um, this, you know, this other thing don't have to always stand in conflict with each other. And I don't know why I never grasped the, the interesting nature of making a brain surgeon doctor a magician, you know, I, mm. I, I, someone who's a so, sorcerer, yeah, who's so steeped in the science world. In fact, mm-hmm. what you can observe and record is what's real, and then putting him in this mindset of literally, you don't know anything anymore. Everything's like crazy and magical, right? Um, Nate, what are your thoughts on that? Have you had, did you pick up on that, that, um, juxtaposition that they do with the character? I did. They, they kind of bring that into it a lot. And they, even in the ancient one, tells him to forget everything mm-hmm. he thinks he knows. Like mm-hmm. everything you have come to learn, spent decades learning and being, a master of doesn't doesn't matter in, in this scenario and and you might be a genius and that might help you learn the books but you have to have an amount of faith to be able to believe it so that's when she you know strands him on the top of mount everest with a sling ring and <laughs> says have at it and leaves him stranded there mm. because she needed to show him to have a little bit of faith and forget the technical yeah. side he can't brain his way out of that no one. so he just had to believe that that portal was going to open and it eventually did and that's the turning point for his character it's believing at that point so mm. it is a very important part of his character mm. and, and everything that's brought into it yeah um you know we we've been touching on on this concept sure. of time a good bit but one thing that you brought up dad is that time isn't necessarily linear right um you know there's the the moment when dharma moves in time loop they even he Steven even reverses time a few points right but we instinctively you know i think this points out the fact that we instinctively know that there's something that exists beyond our understanding of time or outside our our concept of time right you know it, you, you we mentioned it like at the beginning of, of every yeah, podcast. Yeah, I mentioned it myself. Right, yeah. you mentioned it yourself. This concept of eternity, because eternity is not in time. You know, that's just the concept or the, the definition of it. Eternity is written on our hearts. We have this innate longing to understand this idea of, of eternity or or, or, um, or or explore it. Um, Dad, what what are your thoughts on, on that kind of concept that's explored in this movie. Yeah, I think that, you know, I had some, I, you know, I've, I've done a lot of teaching in our, you know, in church settings with, you know, college aged students mm-hmm. that are naturally questioning, right? They're trying to understand and they may not have grown up in a church setting. And I've had one question that I always seem to have people ask me is about the idea of the Trinity. And if you're not familiar with the <sighs> Trinity, it's like, you know, there's this one God, but he's seen in three different people. And how can you be one, but be three different and, and all of this other stuff. And first of all, you know, the it's, it's God. Right. And so when the second that we understand how God works, the second he ceases to be God. Right. And so that's the first thing that I do. But the way I've tried to describe Trinity is you have an author and he's outside of the story and he's writing the story Mm. and then he chooses to then he's so engaged in what's happening in his story 
that he actually writes himself as a character within that story. And so he's outside looking into the story, writing the story himself, but then he's also a character within it. And so when we see it, and when and I use that as an illustration to say, you know, time, we see it moving as in we have our birth date, we have our death date, we have everything in between. That's not how the force works. And then, and it moves linearly and yet time exists you know that's what the what quantum physics is all about that's what the tva and what multiverse of madness and what um you know all of the things that are going on with deadpool and wolverine that comes mm-hmm. out this week is literally about time doesn't work the way that we think it works and we want to make it linear and it doesn't work that way and i think that's one of the things that i love about doctor strange is he allows you to 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 view things from a different mm-hmm. perspective mm-hmm. right yeah well um because Nathan would probably pl- pop a blood vessel or something. We won't take the time. Um, ah. There we go. There it is. To discuss Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. In, uh, least in, de- in detail. In detail, right, yeah. yeah. Instead, uh, we'll shift to Dad's favorite MCU film, Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Okay, Dad. We'll, uh, we'll kind of format your uh your movie the same way we talked nice. we did with nate's um now first off to, now we get to really get started <laughs> yours was the appetizer nate that's right um dad short twitter ex post yeah, why do you absolutely. love this film so much i'm the only one of us that's actually on twitter i want to go home and rethink my life so sure. i can do this yes this is this this is the movie where steve rogers grows up <clears throat> This is where he becomes, he moves away, even in Avengers. Avengers is what starts it, right? The original Avengers Mm -hmm. movie. Yeah. He starts to see he can't trust Nick Fury. He can't trust what's happening around him. This is the movie where he realizes that... This deal is getting worse all the time. It's that the world and reality is not is going to be as black and white as Mm -hmm. he wants it to be. And it makes him a better character. And that's what makes Steve Rogers so special. Because of what we're going to see, what we see in... I know I'm going over my 140 characters here, but um, what we see with Civil War is a Steve Steve Rogers. Yeah, I'm threading. Oh, I we're blue, so I can I can go as long as I want. Um, (laughs) He this is that moment, both in the movie that Sharon Carter Carter steals from him in the movie Civil War. What's from the comic book Civil War, where he's like, Mm -hmm. even though he knows that. The world is not black and white anymore, that there is weirdness going on, that you can't trust people. There's a point where you have to take a line. You have to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to stand for this and that. And you don't make that part of Captain America, of Steve Rogers' work, without him coming to terms with the reality that things aren't as black and white that we see well, in, yes. in this movie. Nick is lying to him even more Absolutely. In, in Winter Soldier. But, yep. um, all right, Letterboxd rating. Um, we'll do the same thing, just real quick. Uh Dad, why don't you go first? Well, yeah, we went first with you last time. Nate, letterbox rating, go. A 4.5 and a like, for sure. I think it's a great movie. It's solid. It, it's it's really well done. And, and I, I really do enjoy it. I really do. It's, Sam, what is yours? Yeah, I'm going to give it 4.5 and a like. Um, whenever I think of an MCU movie that I just like all around and will watch regularly, it's this one. Plus, it's got the best fight choreography and and stuff in the mcu in my opinion it's phenomenal till daredevil born again <laughs> yes till Dare- well, and if you're including the netflix show i think that it, it loses to the netflix mm, show i don't know man there's some good stuff in you don't movie. know the hallway scene <laughs> true all right dad what's what's your rating oh this is five five, five and a love there's no love no doubt like whatever it's a, it's definitely without a doubt the best of all of the MC- mcu well that's in your opinion, opinion. Yeah. it is my, my mind's the only opinion mm-hmm. that works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, now, uh, Winter Soldier, it, it centers around Steve's, you know, continued journey into a more, like you mentioned, Dad, cynical and guarded view of the government, right? You know, when he went in the ice, for the most part, he could trust the, the country and the government, wakes up, and he's been nothing but lied to, literally since the moment he woke up. Mm-hmm. Um, now, why is this critical to Steve's growth as a character? Because he goes into the, you know, it's it's... The world is very different in World War II, you know, 1945, Mm -hmm. when when he goes into the ice. It's very clear 
or it would seem to be. It's very clear <laughs> who the good guys are, the bad guys are when you deal with World War II and you've got Nazis that are literally exterminating six million Jews. Right. And trying to take over the world and Japanese that are trying to, to do the same thing, you know? And so, so you've got a really clear black and white situation. And then he wakes up and he's a man out of time. Mm. Um, when he wakes up in, in New York City and the, before the Avengers movie. And, he, you know, he comes into that movie, Avengers, with, with the same type of, of mindset right. as he had when he went into the ice. And so, what we see at the opening to the winter soldier is he's trying to figure out who he is, what his place is in this new world and what the world really is. And that's what the whole situation with Sam is. That's what, where he's talking about, um, you know, even, even movies and music and stuff. He's like, everything has changed and he's mm -hmm. got to figure out he's, he's watching these movies. He's listening to this music. He's doing these things to try to understand the world right. as it is today. And the reality is he doesn't understand it until he realizes that shield is Hydra and you can't trust Samuel L. Jackson. You can't trust Sharon. Sharon is, is a, is a, is a microcosm of just this. an actor. <laughs> okay. Nick Fury, <laughs> Nick Fury. He can't trust, he can't trust Sharon. I mean, Sharon is a perfect, like small metaphor for everything he goes through. She's the nurse that lives next door that he's got a little bit of a crush on. And instead she's, not only a shield agent, she's a to shield him. agent to protect him. And then and in the next Peggy's Civil War least. movie, in the, in the next Captain America movie, you find out she's the woman that he's in love with niece. Right. I mean, th nothing can be trusted. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes this movie so powerful. And, and of course, you've got all the fight scenes and the better, some of the best cinematography. Oh, yeah. In the, uh, in the MCU, all of those things combined together with you know, Robert Redford is one of the chief bad guys in it and everything else. It just, it makes it perfect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great movie. Um, you know, there's a few, a uh, few good themes in this movie that I want to touch on first being kind of loyalty and trust. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's the loyalty between, um, Steve and Bucky that, uh, Steve never lets go of. And it's what ultimately wins the day in the end. And then of course the idea of trust who he can and can't trust. Um, I mean, he hardly even trusts Natasha for most of the movie. Um, you know, so Nate, what are your, what are your thoughts on that side of things? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it, it follows more into that, that kind of political side that Captain America has always touched on, uh, the entire, Th trilogy touched on it a lot and it's it's more about the, the 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 trust of of institutions like the trust of shield and the fact that you know we we came to know shield for a lot of the mcu i mean this introduced an iron was man even a in show. the first one yeah there's a show and everything and then we find out that shield for like pretty much the entire time has been hydra which is crazy and i mean for us to trust shield that's that's crazy for us but then to think about it from Captain America's point of view of being at, at the creation pretty much mm -hmm. of oh, shield yeah. and then coming back 70 years later to find out that the people he was fighting against sacrificed his life against were actually taking over and were the bad guys the entire time. It, it's an interesting way to look at it for, for Steve mm -hmm. and for him to conquer that and just the entire concept of that trust of, of institutions as well. So. And I think it's important that what we find in, in Steve is he does find his, his foundation in that moment where he realizes you don't trust institutions. You trust what is truly right and what is truly wrong. Mm -hmm. And you trust people. You trust individuals, right? And he, we see that specifically with with Bucky, he knows yeah. who Bucky really is, and he's going to continue to remain loyal to Bucky and trust who Bucky truly is in his core versus all the other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another concept is this, this idea of identity and, and memory. You know, you mentioned Bucky, um, and that Steve, he knows who Bucky is and he knows that Bucky is is lost and lost this concept because he knows Bucky would never do the things that he does in that in that movie. Um, so he's Steve is convinced that if he can help Bucky remember who he was, then he's you know like you mentioned he's doing the right thing. Um, 
you know, Dad, can you expand a little bit more on that idea? Yeah, I think that that you know, it, 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 we talked about this a few weeks ago on our idea of Inside Out too, right? And so, mm-hmm. so in Inside Out too, they've got this I, this concept. You go from Inside Out, which is core memory. Right. To inside out to it's kind of like, what is it? Sense, sense of, self, of self, sense of self. Right. And, and, you know, in this movie, it's, it's following the same sort of secular approach towards that idea right. of, you know, there's our dog is freaking <laughs> um, in the room here uh, with us. But anyway, it's, it's this idea that, that, well, who you truly are in your core is, is the most important thing. I think that what we have on this is, is, you know, a, Bucky is at his core, the, the good guy. And, and Steve trusts in who that is, which right. I talked about. Yeah. And with the war together, he knows yeah. who Bucky and is. And you even seen like Falcon Winter Soldier after Bucky's reformed that he himself doesn't even believe that he's he's changed that he's still that good person he he struggles with that yeah um and another another uh concept that uh is very very prevalent and i find this one especially interesting in this movie is this idea of freedom versus security uh it's that moment when you know it's between Nick and, and, and Nick Fury and, and Rogers when they're walking, going down that elevator. Um, and they're talking about the new helicarriers. I don't remember if they have a specific name or whatever, yeah. but just um, project insight. I yeah. Think project the insight. Basically that like, you know, it can take out a thousand hostiles a minute or something from almost anywhere on the planet. Right. Uh, constantly surveilling the entire planet. So that way they can always take out a threat before they show their, their rear, their ugly head. Right. Um, and then Steve has this one line where he's like, so, you know, we're giving everybody freedom by pointing a gun at their head and, or, and calling it freedom or whatever. He's like, yeah. that's not freedom. Right. That's, what does he call it? It's, that's not freedom. That's, uh, I can't remember specifically. But yeah, it's almost like it's a prison or something like that. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah, that's, and, 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 you know, he would, he would know because it's what Hydra basically wanted to do, right? Um, Nate. What what is your thought on this whole freedom versus security? You know, there's if we want to go there, there's even talks about that in today's climate. I mean, oh, all the time, all the time. You know, people sacrifice their security or their freedom for more comfort and security, and that may not, you know, depending on on your thought process, may not always be the right thing. So, what is what are your thoughts on how this this movie handles right that this, concept? This, this movie handles how Steve handles it is kind of like this this good boy as as showing how he believes in in true true freedom you're a rebel now not security the 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 freedom to make choices for themselves and that's not something so america right (laughs) so and he's seeing how that's not not what he's been fighting for that's not what he fought for that's not what he continues to fight for that's just not how he believes it should go down so it's really interesting to see how Steve handles that, all of those topics in this movie, especially with Nick Fury, because it doesn't even seem like Nick Fury is completely bought in to the side of it. He, he wants, he wants to do the right thing. Nick Fury does, but right. he understands that he's going at it a way that feels a bit extreme, but he feels like it's what the world needs at that moment. Right. Cause it's so far gone. I mean, this is after Avengers and stuff, so he's not right. sure how to handle things. Yeah. Um, well, Doctor Strange and Winter Soldier are fantastic movies. There's no doubt about that. Um, everybody knows that um, the best movie in the franchise uh, is my favorite movie, um, and, and we'll you know we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. The best MCU film. And my favorite, of course, is Avengers Endgame. Kind of a a cop out answer. I feel like I feel like a lot of people say that, but that was a cheap move. I have you know I have good reason to say that. I feel like. (laughs) So why Um, do you love Endgame so much, Sam? Well, I mean, yeah, there's there's all of the the big things that everybody's going to say. It's the culmination of however many years of of Marvel Mm -hmm. that have been what like 
13 years of, at that point of, of Marvel movies that led up to that moment. It had all the cameos and, and characters coming in there with that one moment. I mean, there's so many moments in the movie that if you weren't there in the theater to experience it, you just don't know how exciting it was, you know, light it up. The, 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 the portals moment, cap getting Molnir, all those, all those Avengers things. Assembled. Yeah, yeah. Avengers assembled. Yeah. I mean, all those moments. Right. Um, but then there's the, the the moments with Tony, the overall arc with Tony. Right? And and like Nate, you mentioned how Doctor Strange has the best um single story, single movie character arc. Um Tony has the best character arc in the MCU movies because if you think about it, up until Endgame it's all kind of Tony's story. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other characters are certainly there, very prevalent, have their own story to tell and impact on it. But it starts with Tony, it ends with Tony, right? Um, and like, you know, with any good story, the, the end, this is the culmination of it all. Um, so I think that's that's why I really like it so much. Um, now, like with all the other ones, what's your uh, letterbox rating? Um, Dad, you go first. Sam, are you going to just go five out of... Five and the like. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. no, no question about it, for okay. sure. Uh, end game. Roger, Roger. I'll give it a four point five and the like. Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's phenomenal. It's so much. One of the things about this movie is it makes Infinity War better. Mm, yeah, we weren't really impressed with Infinity War uh, when that came out. It was utterly predictable, um, the way that that movie ended and 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 everything else. So. But when we watched these together that weekend that we were, you know, that precipitated us having this episode in the first place, we watched those back to back and it's a lot of movie to watch back to back. A lot. But it's definitely one phenomenal story when you watch it all the mm-hmm. way through. And so Endgame is, is a, is a great culmination to the Infinity Saga. Yeah. It's- and I can't forget. Being in the theater oh, opening night when <laughs> Captain crazy. America says Avengers assemble and the whole place loses its mind. So. Yeah, it was great. And, and I think it gets a five and a like for me. I really wow. enjoy it. Um, more that just comes from the feeling that when I get watching it more than nostalgia than anything, the movie itself is great. It has its own convoluted it is a complicated movie <laughs> oh man it they is that time a travel. lot into that and it feels a little messy at some points. But I just, I enjoy it every time and it is a great movie and the ending's fantastic. And I think it's just, it's really well done. I enjoy mm-hmm. my time watching it. So, yeah. And there are a few movies, very few movies that can consistently get me to tear up. And this is one of them. This one and Return of the King. Return of the King. Um, Onward, even though Onward, I've maybe, yeah. I haven't watched that one in a long time. That one me. And then cry. even Up. Up. At, at points, that one's okay. pretty. That one's that pretty one's tough. Good. But um, this one especially because it's it's the funeral is very difficult. Um, and major pain. Uh, no, no, I can't say I, I can't cry at that one. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but Endgame, you know, it's it's a lot more than just the culmination of kind of an unprecedented movie making initiative. Um, it's the end of, like I said, the, the story arc for Tony, and it began all the way back with that first MCU film, Iron Man. Um, now, why do you, Nate, feel that the film is successful in balancing this epic 13-year-long, however many movie, 23 movie saga with such a, a personal story? How do you think this movie does think balancing it, that? It does well balancing it because we've had such a connection with most of these characters already. It It's why that we're kind of struggling to find that in the MCU currently because it feels mm-hmm. like they're trying to do movies that are close to as big as this one with new characters. And it just like, like Eternals, you introduce 10 new characters and you made it a huge, like galaxy ending event. And I didn't really care for anything. And then we don't hear anything else about till, the till Tiamat, next Tiamat or whatever until Tiamat. Tiamat. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so it's just really impactful because we've had so long to spend with these characters because we've watched them and rewatched them and been able to digest it for a long time. So we're able to really handle that better. You know, I've been looking out for this concept more when watching movies um, now that we've kind of discussed it a bit. And this movie holds up with it the same um, it holds up to that argument. It's that the movie 
focuses on the characters mm-hmm. and the setting and, and action and all of that comes second. Yeah, walk through how that does it in this movie. Well, though. I mean... Because I think I understand where you're coming from, but I want to hear whole, your perspective. The whole... Even the beginning of the movie, right, starts with... Um, they're trying to figure out what to do because it's their conviction, right? You know, Cap, despite having lost this battle and half the universe is gone, is still committed to doing the right thing, right? Tony is frustrated because he feels betrayed because he ha- was friends with Steve and Steve said that he would be there and then he wasn't, right? You know, there, mm-hmm. it's all these very personal character driven moments. Mm-hmm. And then five years later, whoa. Like, we didn't see that coming. And we still S- let it set for a while mm-hmm. where it lets the you see Cap at the support group. Right. You see, Nat. yeah, we've got Nat doing this, you know, Avengers sort of boardroom S- meeting. Monthly Zoom But meeting, then yeah. as soon as she hangs up the call, she breaks down in tears. Right. right? I mean. It's it's a character story. Mm-hmm. The whole way through. Tony. I agree. Is. Is raising a family now and he can't get involved because he's found something special to him and he could jeopardize that right even the opening of the film centers in on tony well no go what were you the saying? opening of the film the, the, people seem to always forget the opening of the oh, film is when, hawkeye losing his family oh, oh yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. losing his family and that sets up his entire character for this movie, movie and right. a very good um kind of contrast between him and Tony. Mm-hmm. Tony gaining a family through this and yeah. Clint losing his. And oh, yeah. Man, Nate. The that, hit, you're killing the hurt bro. that hits that. So it's really well done. And a lot of people do forget I had that. Ne- hold on. I had, never, I had never, as many times as we've watched this movie, I had never paralleled those two either. in their stories. Uh-uh. Where Hawkeye's story begins losing his family. Tony, then it cuts to Tony and Tony gets back to his family and his story is, is central to he's wanting to keep his family. Right. Yep. Hawkeye's story is him wanting to get his family back. Right. Just, yeah. Just, and that's the conflict in mm-hmm. this movie. Whoa. I mean, you spend a good, what is it, hour and a half at least of this movie with nothing action wise happening. Right. I mean, they don't go back in time till they, they, a halfway they kill point. Thanos, like, that's right. Well, that's it. not even really an action point. I mean, the whole movie is just setting up these character yeah. arcs and where these characters are. Well, and then are. you see what happens with Thor where he loses, you know, he loses, he kind of loses his way. Right. And then he finds his mom and, you know, has his character moment and stuff. Of I course, mean, Hawkeye and uh, Clint and Natasha. And right. That, Every yeah. character has a development through this movie, a character mm-hmm. development. And I think that's what makes it work so well. Um, but of course, like with all films, this one has some major themes. And, and the first one we talked about that, you, you especially brought it up, Nate, with Hawkeye. And that's this idea of grief and loss. I mean, even like with Cap, the first act of this film powerfully, powerfully deals with the loss um, showing superheroes facing a defeat and lost behind comprehension, right? We don't see that in movies very often, especially superhero movies. Usually they get to this moment where things could go wrong. And then in the last moment, the heroes find a way to save the day. And it didn't happen in Infinity War, which again, and it didn't happen at the opening of this movie, which it makes you feel like it's going to. Right. Yeah. They, they're going to get the stones and bring it all back. Um, but of course, you know, this is a three hour movie and they're not going to solve it all in 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, the whole beginning of this film talks about that. And I think that's partially why the whole five years moment was mm. so jarring in the film. Because not only are you you're expecting them to make it all OK there in the beginning with the stones, but then you're like, oh, sir, surely it won't be that long till they fix it. No, that's five years. That's a good chunk of time for half the universe to be gone. I mean, that's like, we kind of see that's enough time for everybody to sort of find a new normal with things, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's kind of like, all right, this is the way things are. I mean, not to get really real world and personal here or not personal, but like, um, COVID, I mean, that was what a year, two years, and we were already people as yeah, society was already kind of getting used to that, that right. new normal. Imagine what five years of this, five years of that would have done. Right. Um, so anyway, I, I've kind of gone no, on a tangent good. there, but really Nate, 
you, you you brought up the Hawkeye thing. So why don't you touch on this idea of grief and loss in this movie? It, it It's very impactful. You see Natasha as well have to deal with it. Somebody that's kind of always been denied a, a family that finally found one, yeah. found one. And then it's just kind of ripped away from her in a lot of ways. But it just feels like she another kind of like this was bound to happen is mm. how she feels about it. And so you see grief and you see loss dealt with in many ways. You see it with Natasha and just kind of uh, an acceptance. You see it with Steve trying to just stay himself and move on. You see it with Clint and kind of a denial. You see it with, with Tony and just finding growth in it using it to grow and it's just you see all of well i think you know you talk about hawkeye though clint clint's response to his grief and his loss is i'm going to punish the entire planet yeah punish everyone who didn't get their just yeah anyone that deserves to die is going to die Mm -hmm. in his eyes yeah deserves to die yeah it's 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 an and and you know we talked about i mentioned thor a minute ago but thor is is he still doesn't know how to process no any of this and so he he resorts to booze and video games which let's just be honest that's not an unusual right re- Response, es- no. release escape for a lot of people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um i think you know th- this is the case in in the doctor strange uh, movie nate which kind of makes the moment in in this movie mean even more but the the idea of sacrifice and redemption is very very prominent in this in this movie i mean there is that that moment when there thanos has the stones captain marvel was almost about to stop him but she was even taken out um it, all hope seems lost tony looks over to, to strange strange holds up his finger denoting that this is mm-hmm. the one reality where they which win. brings us full circle right because right. the, right. the whole ending of our episode ta- starts with strange and tony right, right. Mm-hmm. or ends um, with strange and, and tony. so tony immediately realizes what he needs to do so he goes up you know takes the stones sacrifices himself to finally t- bring an end to thanos and and his his forces but you know tony's arc throughout the entire infinity saga was one where he his failures led to continued devastation right his death in the end was both a sacrifice to save trillions and a final redemption for himself. Um, you know, Tony is inherently a very selfish person, very selfish character. I mean, even when he has the best of intentions, they're selfish. right. I mean, even with him wanting to protect his family, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that, but it's f- still for him, mm-hmm. you know, at, in the end, he realizes what he has to do. It's kind of a, a a beautiful moment when he says, I am Iron Man in the first movie. It's a selfish, cocky ego. Yeah, you're thing. right. You're right. And then in this final moment, he realizes what Iron Man is. It's not for him. It's for the world. Right. Right. It's this, this symbol for the world. So it is a beautiful full, full circle moment for his character. Um, going back to just even the simple sacrifice that, um, Jensen, gave to to save tony in the cave right Mm, i hadn't thought about that you know it it is it that was the moment the turning point for tony i think where he realized that maybe there's more to just being a selfish um guy but what are are your thoughts on all of that yeah i think it's it's a beautiful i think it's it's an unbelievable story i to to, to think that a character like tony stark a, a, a beast a b-level comic book character right he wasn't he's pretty he, goofy in a lot yeah, of things too i won't big. lie like <laughs> he was the reason that marvel had the opportunity to make this movie was because nobody had the rights he's cheap nobody had the rights yeah nobody wanted the rights to this character Mm-mm. so they made this movie as a result of a character nobody cared about right and turned it into one of the most beloved characters in cinematic history with Tony and, and Iron Man. My question for you to kind of before we we close things out, Nate or Sam, is you're the like this is your guy, right? right. Tony Stark is your mm-hmm. guy, right? What do you do? You want them to bring him back in some form in the future in the MCU? Same thing I always do. Talk my way out of it. Yeah, I I do, but I want them to do it in a certain way. Um, I'm thinking Secret Wars, something like that. 
don't bring back our Tony. I don't want to see our Tony again. He had his story. He was great. We don't need any more of that. I want to see an alternate Tony, an alternate alternate universe Tony, where maybe maybe he didn't sacrifice himself, like a Tom Cruise version. No, like we were trying to do a straight multiverse no, madness. No. They said no, still RDJ because okay. he is Tony Stark. But I mean, I want to see a Tony that's that's jaded and and cynical and broken. Right. I want to see maybe even a Tony where he didn't um, sacrifice himself at the end of that battle and maybe steve had to or maybe they never won at all of kind of seeming like what they they're gonna do with uh logan in, in mm-hmm. deadpool and wolverine right i want to see a cynical jaded tony that's maybe even a bit for lack of a better term dark side with things um to see what tony could have been mm. to make what tony is in our story even more impactful um I would love to see that. I mean, RDJ, he's even gone on record now that he's got his Oscar, probably, <laughs> that he would love to return to the character. And I, I would love to see it. Anything else? All right, that's going to just about do it a bit long on this episode, but a lot of a lot of good discussions. It's I worth feel every like. second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell that to Kanja Club. Oh, now, um, you know it. You're listening to this and you're like, that was great. <laughs> that, was, that was 50 minutes. I didn't think it was 50 minutes. All right. So but uh, yeah, our weekly release schedule uh, Mondays are what we're excited about. We were excited about watching uh, some Marvel movies. We want to talk about them. A great choice. Wednesday's new comic book day. Um, this Wednesday, we're going to be talking about what you should know from the comics. This is the clue we need. About Captain America Brave New World. That's I'm very interested fun. in this discussion. Yep. And then Friday is our monthly series this uh, month we are re-examining the sequels and this week i have an idea last one we're looking at the rise of skywalker probably gonna have some very interesting discussions on that yeah. one i have a feeling uh, make sure you follow us on Substack. like we mentioned we're trying to get to 100 subscribers uh free subscribers all right let's get to work so that way we can have a Substack exclusive podcast um that will be headed up by uh the wonderful uh, Bowtie Jedi guy. Um, I've been called the Bowtie Jedi guy in a very long, <laughs> very long time. time. Or Bowtie Bi- Bible guy if you want to get really Ooh, like more yeah, topical. That's another with this world. That's even that predates the podcast. That is that's an old, the podcast. old one. Yeah, but um, you know, a- a- along with that, um, you still get weekly recaps, um, in-depth exploration as to some more of the themes we usually like to talk about, and then of course more community engagement. Um, but I think that's going to just about do it. Is there anything else you want to say? May the force be with you. May the force be with you. May the force be with you, always. This party's over. I like that Wookiee. Don't get technical with me. Joy, please. Yep, yep.